Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man with a reminder that rock and roll, it ain't noise pollution. Here is the captain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week I am very excited because we are featuring Unichrome by the amazing crew brewing the beers over at Pipeworks Brewing Company. Unichrome is a robot unicorn made out of chrome, but it is also a delicious double IPA that is clean, citrusy, and has just the right amount of bitterness. ABV 9.1% garage grade, four and a half bottle caps out of five. And let's give some cheers to our friends that helped us out with this week's beer run. First up, a big cheers to Pat in Albany, Oregon. A big we like you, Jib, to Kelly in Wellsville, Ohio. Next up, we have a cheers to Camilla in Norco, California. And a big shout out to Jessica in Phoenix, Arizona. Here we go. We have a cheers to Benjamin in Geraldton, Ontario, Canada. And last but certainly not least, we have Katie Keon and the parts that remain unknown. Everyone we just mentioned, they went to our website, helped us out with this week's Beer Fun, and for that, we are grateful. Yeah, B-W-E-R-U-N, Beer Run. If you need some more True Crime Garage for your earballs, check out our bonus show on Stitcher Premium. It's only $5 a month. You get our show, plus you get every bonus show on Stitcher Premium. There's a ton of content. It's a Netflix for podcasts. Get on it, people. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. As schools all over Ohio and across this great nation prepare to close down for the summer and kids gear up for the much-needed summer break, it is this time of year every year that many remember and think about little Asenith Louise Ducat. Friends and family called her Asini. She was a third grader at Barrington Elementary in the Columbus, Ohio suburb of Upper Arlington. 
The city of Upper Arlington and the people who live there are some of the best that Columbus has to offer. This is an affluent area. Families stay here for generations to live in this tight-knit community, to raise their children up in a safe, peaceful area, and thrive in nearby Columbus. Many Ohio State graduates stay or plant their roots here in the city of Upper Arlington. Sini School and Home were located in what was thought to be a very safe, sleepy, upper-class neighborhood. But unfortunately, there was something bad bubbling up. There was something evil lurking in this very neighborhood. Several girls reported to their parents that they didn't always feel safe walking in the neighborhood. More than one girl said that she felt like she had been followed, and not just on one occasion. It was difficult to understand what was happening. The neighborhood, as everyone thought, was still the same old sleepy upper-class neighborhood. And maybe these were just the imagined fears of children. However, that something bad that was bubbling up to the surface boiled over on June 3rd, 1980, just days before the end of the school year. This is when little Sini was intercepted by that evil element somewhere along the very short walk from Barrington Elementary School and her home, which was just blocks away. The distance was less than a mile, a 20-minute walk. This is a walk that Sini made many times, and one that was even shorter for her, as kids know all of the shortcuts and cut-throughs. But on that bright and sunny day, Something got her. In the short window of just four hours, Sini was first missing, and then she was gone forever. According to the Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost website, on June 3, 1980, at 4.34 p.m., the Senith Ducat was reported missing by her parents after she did not arrive home from school. The victim's parents indicated that Sini walked home from school and would usually arrive home at 4 p.m. After an extensive search, Sini's body was discovered in a drainage ditch at the corner of Riverside Drive and Waltham Road, which is less than one block from her residence, at about 7.30 p.m. the same evening. The investigation revealed that her death was caused by blunt force trauma to the head and manual strangulation. Investigators believe that the victim was abducted and murdered at a location other than where she was found. The town was devastated. The neighborhood was terrified. Upper Arlington lost one of their own. A young, outgoing, intelligent little girl was attacked in an area where she likely felt the safest. This was her neighborhood where she lived with her four older siblings and her mom and her dad. She was literally just a two-minute walk from her home when she was cornered and grabbed, snatched off of the street, and killed just a short time later. Who would do such a despicable and monstrous act? How could this happen here? And how could an entire community in mourning carry on without this bright little girl? Upper Arlington did carry on, but so many have not forgotten Sini and what happened to her. It's been over 40 years, and the still strong, still proud community where Sini lived still remember the talkative, energetic little girl who did not make it home that one day. That one day when a neighborhood was forever changed and permanently scarred. That one day when evil came to town. Or did it? You see, there is a lot of evidence in Sini's case to suggest evil did not come to town, that evil was already there. Always there lurking in the streets of this sleepy upper-class neighborhood. There is good reason to believe that Sini may have even known her killer or one of the persons responsible. The killer or killers may have known that there was only one way to keep this girl quiet, after she was taken and assaulted. But the community has refused to keep quiet about what happened, what was taken from them, 
what was stolen away from the city and the Ducat family. The members of this community are UA, and they are UA strong. As strong as a bear with a heart of gold. The kids in this neighborhood never forgot Sini. Some to this very day wish that they would have been walking with the little girl on June 3rd. And if so, maybe this would not have happened. But unfortunately, from where I stand and the way things look to me, a tragedy like this was simply going to happen. That bad element was on the rise. And that evil was going to bubble up and boil over at some point. And it did that day, when Sini was at the corner of Waltham and Malvern. So it's important to remember that Sini, in her final minutes, while she was scared and surrounded, she was actually in some not-so-easily-explained way protecting another little girl. Probably even one of her friends, because this evil did not come to town. It was always there, right there in that sleepy, upper-class neighborhood. Before the end of the school year, Sini's classmates, in memory of, wrote the following acronym for and about Sini, but in her proper name, the Senith. This is from Mrs. Subert's third grade class at Barrington Elementary School. Asenith Ducat, a friendly third grader. She always had a sunny smile. Her eyes glimmered and sparkled like stars. Nice, considerate, honest, polite, and aware of other people's feelings. The class has happy thoughts of her. She will always be remembered. In August of 1980, Asina's father, Alexander, was interviewed by the UA News. I believe this quote clearly showcases the strength, the resolve, and the compassion of the Ducat family. Quote, We have suffered a great loss, but it's not a reoccurring one. She's gone, but the community may have to go through this again. This case doesn't have to be solved for our benefit. The Lord will deal with this fellow in his own way. We don't wish the killer any vengeance. Sometimes we pray for his soul, that he may be saved. But we are concerned about the safety of others. He may try to wreak this tragedy on someone else. I can't picture a person who is capable of rape and murder living a normal life. I am sure we will hear from him in one way or another. Alexander Ducat, August 6, 1980. The Ducats were and remained UA and UA strong. This is True Crime Garage, and this is the still unsolved murder case of a Senith Sini Ducat. This is a case that we have wanted to cover for a while now, a couple years in fact, and it's only been covered a little bit, and here we are today, Captain, covering it for the very first time. And there have been some speed bumps along the way that got in the way of us covering this at an earlier date, and we will discuss those at a later time in these episodes. But we are here today to talk about the unsolved murder of Asenath Ducat. Asenath Ducat was born July 24th, 1971. And on our day in question, she was eight years old. She went by the nickname Sini. And later that day, when her parents would report her missing, she was listed as four foot five and a half inches tall, weighing about 68 pounds. She had brown hair and brown eyes. And she was in the third grade at Barrington Elementary School, which was located on Barrington Road in Upper Arlington, which is a suburb of Columbus, Ohio. Our day in question is June 3rd, 1980. This is a Tuesday, and this would be a bright and sunny Tuesday. On this day, Asenath left school at 3.10 p.m. This is 10 minutes later than her usual dismissal time. Sini and her classmates had to serve a 10-minute detention for rowdy behavior, disrupting the class. This delay caused her to miss the crowd that she would have regularly walked home with. So typically, 
She's walking home less than a mile. This walk would take her less than 20 minutes to make it from the door of her school to the front door of the Ducat family home. And on this day, she's going to be walking alone because those other friends from other classrooms have left and already made the trek from the school to their homes. There were several eyewitnesses that saw her walking home that day. It's believed that she disappeared sometime between 3.20 and 4 p.m. on that day. Now, what we do have here, Captain, is that we have a situation where mom gets worried because Sini usually arrives home every day at the same time. And when her daughter, her youngest child, is not there, Sini, she starts to get a little nervous. And this is going to be followed by sending out the other kids of the Ducat family to go out on their bicycles and walk the streets and ride their bikes to look for their little sister. It's also going to be followed with Mrs. Ducat calling the school to ask where her daughter was and calling a couple of her friend's parents. I imagine this would be friends that she would typically walk home with. And she's going to find out about this 10 minute detention and realize very quickly the Sini was probably traveling by herself, walking home alone that day from school. Again, this 10-minute detention didn't come about until the day of, on June 3rd, 1980. She's also going to call her husband, Alex, or Alexander, and let him know that their daughter did not come home from school yet. Alex works within walking distance of the family's home. He will actually end up leaving work a few minutes early on this day to help go look for little Sini. So I'm not that clear on the details, but it was either the whole class that got a detention or a group of kids because they were talking too much in class, but kind of odd that they would be handed out a 10 minute detention for that day. Normally you'd have to serve your detention on another day. Yeah. I'm guessing a couple things here, captain one, It makes sense to me. It's the end of the school year. Kids get a little rowdy. They probably weren't listening to the teacher. Teacher gets upset and has to continually warn the kids and then decides, you know what, I've got to make an example here and let them know that they can't just do whatever they want. So here's a 10-minute detention, probably served by the whole class. We got to keep it short, though, I'm guessing, because some of those kids are going to be riding buses home. Some of these kids, as we said, like Sini, will be walking home. Now, I've heard it reported that like 1980 was something different than the setup that we have today, that many more kids walked home back then. If you looked up where the Ducats lived and this Barrington Elementary School, it's less than a point ninth of a mile. I believe it's typical for kids that live in the same neighborhood as the school to commonly walk to school. So I don't believe that it's any different 1980 than it would be today of the amount of kids that were walking to and from school. When I was growing up, Captain, when you were growing up, if our school was in the same neighborhood, you just walked because the buses didn't travel that short distance or mom and dad would drop you off at the school. Well, Colonel, can you give us a general overview of this case and then we can come back through and do a very detailed account of the events. Yes, so as we said, Sini was walking home from school. It's believed that she was last seen within just blocks of her home that day. Her body was eventually found at approximately 7.30 p.m. So let's note those times here before we get to that very detailed timeline of June 3rd. We have people that say that they have seen Sini around 3.20 p.m., maybe even a few minutes after that. So we believe that she obviously went missing during some point after that 3.20, 3.25 marker on that day. Her body is found at approximately 7.30 p.m. that day. So what we're really working with here roughly is a window of about four hours where we have a lot of question marks and a lot of blanks to fill in. And I think we will be able to do that with some of this timeline that we will later present. But her body was found. This is after an extensive search. Remember, we've already said brothers and sisters are out looking for Sini. We have neighborhood kids looking for her. Mom and dad are out looking for her. Mom's driving around the neighborhood looking for her. 
This is followed by an official search that is going to start after the missing persons report is filed with the Upper Arlington Police Department at 4.34 p.m. on that same day. So we got a lot of people in a small area looking for this little girl, and yet we have four hours where we have to fill in and figure out what was going on during that time frame. Her body was found at the mouth of a culvert located at the corner of Riverside Drive and Waltham Road. So to give a very basic description of this area, what we have here, Captain, is Riverside Drive is a very busy road. It was back in 1980. It still is to this day. In fact, if you look up the population for Upper Arlington, the population is roughly the same today as what it was back in 1980. It's only about 1,500 people more. So traffic and things like that are not significantly different. However, the lay of the land is significantly different, especially right here on this corner. This area has been landscaped and renovated several times since 1980. Now, think of your neighborhood growing up, everybody out there in listener land. And you know the busy road that is just outside of your neighborhood that mom and dad say, hey, Wherever you go, you can go ride your bikes, you can go play with your friends, but you do not go near that road, you do not go across that road. Well, this would be that road. Riverside Drive, very busy road. Waltham Road is right off of Riverside, and it's one of the main vessels through this neighborhood, through Sini's neighborhood. Her body is eventually found near this intersection of Waltham and Riverside Drive. The interesting thing about that to me, Captain, is this is very close to her home. It's less than a two-minute walk from her front door to where her body was ultimately found. Yeah, my parents would always say, don't play by that busy intersection, but stop hanging out with that kid that thinks he's a colonel. <laughs> Too young to be a colonel. So, unfortunately, her body is found four hours later, and this is about a block from her home. And I encourage everyone to look this up on a map because it will shock you how close she was found to her home. And it was determined that she was sexually assaulted and her death was caused by blunt force trauma to the head and manual strangulation. The murder weapon, I've actually seen several different weights for this murder weapon over the years. I've seen she was killed with a rock. Someone took a rock and hit her in the head with it. And I've seen this rock to have weigh as little as 12 pounds or as many as 25 pounds. Most of the information that I've reviewed over the years suggests that this is a 20 to 25 pound rock. So this is a pretty big rock. Now, the area that she's found, there's a lot of rocks there. And this rock was recovered. It was still at the murder scene. And that's something that's key to remember here, too. Murder scene. She was killed where she was found. So what you're saying is law enforcement believes a perpetrator or multiple perpetrators took her, assaulted her somewhere, transport her alive to this location, and then the murder took place at that location where she was found. Yes, that is correct. And here's the thing, though. I think that we're going to be able to lay this out in a very easy to understand way, easy to grasp everything that we have seen over the years in her case. I don't think that things were so clear for law enforcement at the time when they were investigating this case. We have the benefit of 42 years of looking at this case and looking at the different information that have come up in 42 years. They did not. One thing that police revealed was that there had been a previous and a very similar attack in that similar area on May 7th. So less than a month earlier, a similar type of victim and a very similar type abduction took place in that same neighborhood. Now, this would be news to some of the people in the neighborhood, but not to everyone in that neighborhood. Were there any eyewitnesses to this previous situation before the murder? Yes, there were. So we have the survivor of the attack, and then we also have a potential eyewitness in that situation. The thing here, Captain, is eyewitnesses are key in this case. Eyewitnesses for the day that Sini was killed, and eyewitnesses on this other attack that may or may not be related. However, what we do know is at the time of Sini's murder, that police absolutely did think 
that it was highly likely that the two were in fact connected so much so that they are releasing a sketch, a composite sketch to the public of the individual that they believe may have been spotted in Sini's attack, or at least in the area of where Sini was last seen. And this is believed to be a similar sketch, a similar composite sketch to the earlier attack that took place in May. Again, just less than one month earlier. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Can 3D printed life-size organ models help to map out complex surgeries ahead of time? Is it possible? It already is right here. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. All right, cheers, mates. Cheers to you, Ken. Make sure you slap that bass big time. Big time. Detective Ed Tyne was one of the lead investigators in Asenath's murder case. He put together some really invaluable information on this case that I think still holds a lot of weight to this day. And this is how we can get a clearer picture of those four hours that went by from the time that she was last seen to the time that her body was discovered at the mouth of that culvert. This is a timeline put together by Detective Ed Tyne, and it starts roughly at 3 p.m., and it's going to take us all the way up until about 7.30 p.m. that night. Now, a lot of these names have been redacted, and then on top of that, these times are not exact. Most of them are going to be approximate. So I think it was key to give an overview of the general information of the case and what is known of that day first before we start getting into the specifics because this could get a little confusing without having that information prior. At the start of Detective Tyne's timeline, we have 3.10 p.m. And it's stated here that the victim, Asina Dukat, and the rest of her third grade class was dismissed after they had been held over for 10 minutes for a class detention. Normal dismissal time was 3 p.m., as we've already discussed. At 3.10 p.m., we have a lady that is driving home. She returns to her home on Waltham Road. Waltham Road is not only part of the intersection where her body was found near, but this will be part of her route home back to her house. Now, this lady says that at about 3.10 p.m., she pulls into her driveway on Waltham Road, and she observed an unknown male white wearing blue jeans, a white shirt, and possible blue jean jacket walking out of the field. And this is a field that is located directly across from the intersection of Waltham and Hillside. 
This location is eight city blocks west of the Barrington Elementary School, so very near Sini School. At approximately 3.15 to 3.20 p.m., a classmate of Sini's sees her walking, observes her walking westbound on Waltham Road, crossing Arlington Avenue. Now, at 3.15 p.m., this is just five minutes after the lady that lived on Waltham returned home, she goes outside to do some lawn work and notices that the man that she saw earlier is no longer there. She does not see him at this time. We also have a second classmate of Sini's see her walking west on Waltham at Coventry and Barrington around this same time. It's important to remember that any individual that's seen at this time in this area could be a suspect. We have a driver that reports at approximately 3.20 p.m. I think this time is probably a little early in the timeline, but again, we're going off of this eyewitness off of their report. This says at approximately 3.20 p.m. while driving westbound on Waltham Road and at Malvern Road, he observed a male white with dark glasses carrying a limp girl into the yard of, and then the name is redacted, off of Malvern Road. He also saw a red bicycle lying along the curb in the south side of Waltham and Malvern Road. So, This is interesting because later, of course, we know that Sini is abducted and killed in this area. This motorist at this time does not believe what he is witnessing to be anything of importance until, of course, later that day at 730 when we find out the worst thing that a neighborhood could experience, experience. He's saying simply that he saw the bike. He saw a girl being carried away by a guy. He made the assumption that she had wrecked her bike was injured and this was either her brother or father tending to her and carrying her away. So what he believes that he sees is something very innocent, something very normal. However, he's going to find out hours later that something not innocent and not normal at all happened in this general area, maybe at this same time. And we're going to have a lot more eyewitnesses to this male on a bicycle. Yeah, at approximately 3.20 p.m., we have another witness who says that they observed a male white with dark hair, approximately 18 to 21 years of age, riding westbound at Gulford and Fairfax on a bicycle. He was wearing a white shirt and dark trousers. This seems to match up with the previous descriptions we have by other eyewitnesses. Again, we see the bicycle and we see a similar outfit along with a uh, similar age description for this unknown male. At 325, we have a similar report of another individual that lives on Tremont Road that says that they observed a male in his 20s, six foot tall ish, average build with brown hair, white short sleeve shirt, dark pants, running south and carrying a small child. The witness goes on to say that she also saw a red bicycle on the south side of Waltham in the bushes by the pine trees. Now, can you imagine if you saw a teenager or somebody in their early 20s carrying a child? This is not going to look natural. This is not going to look like they're playing around. At the same time, though, you got to keep in mind, around this 3 o'clock hour, we have two schools in this neighborhood. So you're going to see a lot of kids kind of out walking around or on bikes at this time. Right. The other thing, too, that we need to point out, because that description that I gave is just a little tricky there, the witness lives on Tremont. She's not saying that she saw or witnessed this on Tremont Road. She's saying that she witnessed this near Waltham Road. On the And the bicycle was on the south side of Waltham Road. So this individual lives nearby, but was driving in this general area where they witnessed this man or young man carrying a small child. We also need to point out that this Tuesday in 1980 was a primary election day. And we have two locations in this neighborhood that are voting locations. So we have additional people that are out and about on this day for the purpose of voting. And we get our first witness, eyewitness, who says that on their way to voting saw something that might be of interest to our case. 
So this is a woman who lives on Riverside Drive. Says that she walked to vote at First Community Village. First Community Village is very near where Sini Ducat's body was later found. She says that she crossed the culvert on her way and observed a male white standing on the south side of the creek at approximately 100 yards east of her. She said that there was something red and blue, cloth-like, on the ground in front of him. This occurred between 3.25 p.m. and 4.20 p.m. Now, another thing to note there as well, I know that she's giving us a window of time that is approximately an hour, but this individual is crossing the same culvert where Sini Ducat's body will later be found. I've walked and crossed this culvert several times. I would find it incredibly difficult to believe that anybody whether they were looking around or not, would not have seen her lying there on that day at that time. So what this tells me is even though we don't know exactly what time this woman is walking and crossing the culvert, she says between 3.25 p.m. and 4.20 p.m., whatever time she crossed that culvert, Sini is not there. She's not there at this time. And that's going to be key to our case. Now, at approximately 3.40 to 3.50 p.m., we have another woman who returns to the culvert after voting and decides to pick up a rock from the creek that she's going to take home and use as a paperweight. The rock came from the location where the body is later discovered. Again, this person gives us a different window, 3.40 to 3.50 p.m. So now we can say, based off of these two eyewitness statements, that even if we go to the earliest parts of their timeline, of their window that they provide for us, that at 3.25 to 3.40 p.m., Sini is not located. She's not in that culvert at that time. So our window for those four hours is starting to shrink a little bit. Now, if we were to take that out to the end of their windows, we're up to 4.20 p.m. I mean, it doesn't seem a little insane the day that they find this missing, murdered girl where there's a bunch of rocks at that somebody stopped to pick up a rock to use it for a paperweight. It seems very bizarre to me, number one, but number two, I think that it, it's one of those things that come up in, in question, you know, when, when police interview you and you're telling them about your day, they want to know why you did everything. Why, why the hell would you stop to pick up a rock? Or why did you notice that she wasn't there? What, what proof do you have for that? Why were you looking around? Why weren't you just minding your own business? Well, I decided to stop and pick up a rock for a paperweight. Sounds weird to me. However, I don't have this person's name as it's been redacted, so I don't know if I should be questioning her statement. Mm -hmm. If she's just a regular Mrs. Citizen, then I don't question her statement, and I believe it to be true. And I'm really just trying to figure out when Sini was placed in that culvert because that's a fact that we know for certain that happened. And we have the statement of police saying that she was killed there. So we're trying to shrink this window of time, this four hours to a much smaller amount of time because we have all these different people that are seen in the area walking about at this time. One of those people that were seen is responsible for this, if not more than one that was seen. And so we want to really narrow down who it could be that placed Sini in that culvert that day. Well, here's something that's also pretty strange in this case. Mr. Ducat, like you were stating earlier, he works close enough to the family's home that he could walk home. Well, he is going to cross that, that culvert where she is found. So if she was there at the time, it's most likely that Mr. Ducat would have seen his daughter. Yeah, and we're going to be able to put a lot of people in this area where her body would eventually be found that do not see her there. They do not see her body lying in that culvert. And that really shrinks the window here. So again, he would have had to walk across this little bridge to get over this culvert. And I'm telling you, there's no way, unless you got blinders on, man, on both sides of your head, there's no way that you're not seeing her lying there on the rocks. At 4.40 p.m. is when Mr. Ducat left work, and he walked home. His normal route would make him cross that culvert. Right. I don't have an exact time for when he was crossing that bridge that day, but we know it was after 4.40 p.m. 
So our window is getting even smaller. This is going to take us all the way up to 5.55 to approximately 6 o'clock p.m. When we have a woman who lives on Waltham Road, she walk across the culvert on her way to vote. Again, does not see Sini in the culvert. We're now up to 6 o'clock. Her body's going to be found before 7.30 p.m. I think one of the things that makes cases more difficult, like in the 80s, is that not everybody has a clock on them, where now almost everybody carries a cell phone. Your cell phone has some some kind of clock on it. And also you have then time frames of, well, I saw this happen, and then this person texted me, so I know it was before that time. Where in the 80s, if you're not carrying a pocket watch or a wristwatch, you probably have no reference of time. So some of these people's time frames could be off by you know 10 to 15 minutes, give or take. The other thing that we didn't have or wasn't so readily available back then that we have today is this first community village where people are going to and from for voting purposes. They would have had, today they got a bunch of cameras set up. So they'd be able to go, okay, Mrs. So-and-so says that she crossed the culvert to come here and vote. And we have her walking through our doors at this time. And Mr. So-and-so says that he left and then had to cross the culvert to get back to his house. Well, we have him leaving our doors at this time. And so we would be able to get more exact times. These times to me are still incredibly important. And it's important to shrink this window. We have another eyewitness. This is two people actually that say between 6.15 and 6.30 p.m., We have a woman with her son. Her son is young. We know this because he's on a tricycle. If he's he's not young, that would be weird. Hey, sounds awesome sauce to me. But the two of them cross the culvert between 6.15 and 6.30 p.m. This, again, the same location where the body was later found. Now, at 7.26 p.m., Officer Mike Worley, along with two other individuals, remember, By this point in the evening, we have neighbors, friends, neighborhood kids out looking for Sini. Plus, we have the police actively looking for Sini at this time. So at 7.26 p.m., we have a a police officer along with two adults from the neighborhood. The three of them together sadly discover the body of a Sina Dukat lying at the base of an open culvert in a stream located on the north side of First Community Village. And this is directly from the police report. The victim is lying in approximately four inches of running water with a large rock covering her head. Her head had been crushed by the large limestone rock that had been taken from the creek bed. She was fully clothed, although there were indications that her pants had been down at one time and then pulled back up. It was observed that the pants were unbuttoned and there was grass in her undergarments. Well, such a sad scene. And we we see so many cases like Delphi or West Memphis 3 where the the whole community is searching for a missing child or missing children and that they don't discover the bodies until the next day. This one, within a couple hours, they're discovering her body. It's almost like these killers or killer is almost not worried about even trying to conceal the body whatsoever. Correct. And actually what I think has happened here, Captain, is we run into a situation where things started going badly for the killer or killers. And now they're just making impulsive decisions based off of getting the hell out of the area as quickly as they can. Again, it's awfully confusing and such risky behavior to see such a horrible act and such a a a, a crime take place in an area that we can clearly see there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of people out and about for the purpose of voting this around the evening hours. But again, go back to the three o'clock hour. We have two schools in this neighborhood that are letting out in that three o'clock hour. So there's a lot of kids out and about during the time that she was abducted. Unless one were to think that she was just hanging out and doing God knows what for three hours before something terrible happened to her. 
And I don't think anybody believes that at all. I certainly don't believe it. I think she was snatched on her way home from school. And then obviously based off of the timeline we just went through, she had to be gone for several hours before someone placed her in that culvert because we have all these people that say they walked across that culvert and did not see Asina Dukat at any time. Well, what's so sad too is that she would be more likely to talk to a kid, you know, somebody in their late teens, even early 20s. When you're that age, eight years old, you're you're viewing a, even a 20-year-old as one of you, you know, like, oh, that's just an older kid. You don't necessarily, with kids and, and teenagers, view them as dangerous. And so they were able to lure her in, and then, then this assault takes place, and now they go, well, there's a good chance that she knew her attacker or attackers because it seems like they they thought the only the only way out of this is that we have to kill her so she can't identify us. Well, and the thing here is that goes back, everything that you're saying goes back to all of these eyewitness accounts, right? The other people in the area at the time that are spotted by the citizens saying, hey, yeah, I, we have one person saying, I saw the victim walking home at this time in this location. And we have other eyewitnesses saying, I saw a young male, probably 20 years old, of average build, approximately six foot tall. He's in the area at the same time. We have two people that say they believe they saw a similar looking man carrying a small child or a little girl across the street around the same time that is Zenith would have been abducted on her way home. Now, I want to take this opportunity to clear up a couple things here because I've seen it reported plenty of times this way that there were some unusual deviations in Sini's route that she took home that day. I have discussed this with several people and confirmed this with people that knew Sini, and it was explained to me as such that Sini had a preferred route that she would take from her school to her home, and there was a group of kids that she would typically walk with. Well, some of the other kids in the group had a different route that they preferred. And when the kids, when the entire group was there, they would take this other route. It's a more straightforward route, less turns, less twist. Sini's route might be a little quicker, but for whatever reason, it's been noted by several of her friends that this was the route that she preferred. Now, we do know that she was walking alone that day, and so she would have taken her preferred route. Now, we go back to the idea of unusual deviations. Well, why would they believe that there were unusual deviations? Well, we know the route that she ultimately took on the day that she was abducted and killed because we have several things. One, we have the eyewitness statements of what time and where she was and where she was walking at those times, as well as they brought in a scent dog to track her movements from the school and her route home that she took. So I believe that the earlier portions of her route that have those deviations are simply based off of a route that she preferred. And that was the route that she chose to take that day. Now, the other deviations that are the later part of her route, those aren't deviations that she was making by choice. In my opinion, Captain, that is when she started to get nervous. She was being followed. She did not like somebody that she's seeing in the area. She felt uneasy, and maybe she diverted from her route to get away or to avoid someone. Or, a scarier thought, at some point she's being chased by this individual. Well, let's dive into some of the details of this murder scene. Yes, because the layout of where Sini is ultimately found is very important to this case in figuring out who is responsible. So her body is actually found near a near the mouth of a culvert. This culvert runs under a service road. And mind you, if you look at pictures from 1980 compared to 2022, the layout of this land has changed a little bit over the years. It's been filled out a little more. 
But the other place that is curious that is nearby this culvert where her body is found is a tunnel which the locals, or at least the children of the neighborhood, called Frankenstein's Cave. Now, we mentioned earlier that your parents, if you lived in this neighborhood, would tell you, do not go to Riverside Drive. You do not cross Riverside Drive walking or on your bike. The road is just far too busy. It's too dangerous for people crossing on foot or on a bike. But this Frankenstein's Cave is a larger tunnel that runs underneath that Riverside Drive. Now, this would be another location that your parents would likely tell you that you are not allowed to go to. The other thing, too, as a child, you may not want to go there anyway because it's called Frankenstein's Cave. If there were anybody to be hanging out there, this would be the older kids, the teenagers, the uh, maybe people were down there drinking beer, smoking a joint, and somebody had spray painted Frankenstein's Cave inside the tunnel on one of the walls, the tunnel wall. So this is how it kind of got its name. Other than that, it's a little tricky to figure out where the name came from. But ultimately, Sini's body is recovered at the mouth of this culvert, which is underneath the service road, runs underneath the service road that is near Frankenstein's cave that runs underneath Riverside Drive. Again, we had multiple witnesses that are traveling, that are traversing this area, this exact area for that four hour time period of when she was gone. So you have to believe based off of those witnesses, not seeing her there where she's later found that she wasn't there until much later in the evening, closer to the time that she was discovered. Again, the time that we have on record for the police is 726 PM. There was also a brief description in the Columbus Dispatch about her autopsy. Yes, according to the June 10th, 1980 Columbus Dispatch, skull brain injury killed Ducat girl autopsy shows is the headline. A brief description of that article is as follows in a Columbus Dispatch newspaper article published on the 10th. A preliminary autopsy reported that eight-year-old Asina Ducat died of skull fractures and brain contusions inflicted when she was struck on the head with a 20-pound shale-type rock. The autopsy also showed that the third grader had been raped. Handprints were left on both sides of her throat as her attacker choked her. Bruises were found beneath both eyes and on the left side of the nose. Upper Arlington police were to distribute pamphlets describing the murder suspect to motorists on Waltham Road near where the body was found. They hope to find another witness in addition to the woman who is thought to have seen the killer carrying the youngster into the retirement complex grounds. Police also believe that Ducat's killer was the same person involved in the attack of another schoolgirl on May 7th. Police described the man as white, between the ages of 16 and 20 years old, with a Mediterranean look. The killer was riding a red Schwinn 10-speed bicycle. Thank you for joining us here in the garage. We would be nothing without you We love you, and thank you so much for the support and telling your friends and family about us. That's how we continue to grow, and we appreciate you more than we can even begin to put into words. Join us back here in the garage tomorrow. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't listen. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? 
Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D printed life size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go.